Um, so I realized after I had like actually said the the uh, sent the talk in and everything that the the name of the talk is slightly off. The the library uh, that we're going to be using is GPerf Tools, which is a uh, a pr uh, profiling application or library that is used uh, and created by Google um, to help. Per, like to help find performance issues, memory leaks, um, and uh, object allocations and whatnot in their uh, in their overall uh, architecture to make sure that their code is as performant as possible. Um, so we're going to actually be going over the CPU profiler only, but the tool can be used for for other things. Um, that being going over the uh, the number of object allocations and uh, inspecting the heap to see if there are any um, memory leaks. So um, the reason why I chose to do this particular talk is actually because it can be used for multiple programming languages. Um, and so we're going to go over uh, fairly briefly and quickly how, um, how to get a profile created in a bunch of different languages um, and some of the stumbling blocks I found as I was trying to trying to get certain ones of them. Um, but the format of the talk, I am open to answering questions during the talk in case anybody gets lost. So um, if you ever have a question, just raise your hand. This is basically just like a classroom session. So um, with that said, we're going to, to dive right into generating a... Uh, a profile, and uh, to do that, I figured I would start by showing how to do it in uh, Unix uh, Linux operating system. Uh, in this case, Ubuntu. And oh my God, that is enormous text. Um, so, and do we think we can do one more? Can people read that? So um, the way that you can generate uh, a profile in uh, in this application uh, in this using this library, you need to install the library first. You can download it, but just by searching for gperf tools on Google, um, it will. You can either compile it from source, which I did in uh, both of the both operating systems. Fairly simple, just a straight like configure. Um, make make install, um, and it auto detects like what operating system you're running on. So there's very little that you need to do when you're configuring it. Uh, it does. I do believe they have pre-compiled uh, assets as well, so you don't necessarily need to configure uh, compile from source. But it's that option's available to you if you want. Um, so the easiest way that I've seen to to be able to run um, to be able to run and get a uh, to get something out from uh, gperf tools when in Unix, uh, as you can see, this is just a very very simple Python thing that's just timing uh, how much like how much time it takes to add to uh, add two arrays together. Um, but the the way that this is done is by Having the uh, using the LD preload, um, oops, that wasn't quite right. Uh, the LD preload um, environment variable um, to specify where your shared object is, um, and then to specify a uh, a profile output. Uh, in this case, num.prof. Uh, and then you just run the command that you would normally run. So for Python, this is just going to be running using the Python uh, executable and the Python file that you're running. And so when you just run that, you'll get this output that says the number of interruptions, evictions, and the bytes uh, created. The interruptions are really the, the interrupts are the part that we like, kind of pay attention to the most, at least when I'm doing it. Um, and that's basically how many times when your program was running, it was sampled. Um, so 
that generated a um, a profile um, file that if you go into it, it's just kind of a unique uh, file specification. Uh, you can actually look up how they how they generate it. But um, to actually make this usable, you're then going to use pprof, which is why I was confused about what I should call the talk. Um, so in this case, we're going to use pprof, pass in a dash dash text, which is going to give us a text output, um, and then you specify the executable that, um, that has the symbol definitions, the symbol definitions being the names of the various methods that you're using and what have you, um, and then the, uh, the file, uh, the profile file. So when you run this, you get an output like this that pretty much gives you um, what time was spent uh, in each one of the steps. So this is broken down into, into five different columns. And then the last, uh, the last column is the, uh, the method name that's being used to, to run everything. Um, over here is the number of profiles that the method showed up as the top uh, of the stack. This percentage on over here is the number, the percentage of samples that it showed up as, as the top of the stack. And then this is a running total of the, um, of the percentages. So if you look, 18.9 plus 16.7 is 35.6. Um, for the most part, I actually don't use that part when I'm doing it, and you'll see why when I get into the, uh, into the Ruby stuff, particularly when working with Rails. But um, this over here is the number of profiles that this method shows up anywhere in the call stack. So it's basically a, a definition of how much time is spent in it and any of its called descendants. Um, so uh, if we were to look at this, um, we've got the, the, add, uh, the add method that's taking up 13.3% of the time, but, and then we've got the pylist new that it and all of its de descendants are taking up 27.8% of the time. And so basically that is more what I use to figure out what's being created, like what's taking up time in the code that I can control. Um, again, I'm going to show you a little bit more about how to, to dive into this to find where your performance implications are um, when we get to, to the Ruby. So to, um, to do it in uh, a compiled language like Rust, which is kind of interesting, um, in Unix you can uh, just do the, the LD preload thing. Uh, oh no! <laughs> Um, lift up the uh, just a little bit, probably okay. just a little bit underneath that you can see it. Okay. Can everybody see that line now? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, when doing the, uh, now I'm all confused. Um, so, when doing the, uh, When doing the when doing it with Rust in Unix, uh, apparently I <sighs> you basically do the same. Uh, that's why it was wrong because I am doing the wrong command. Um, you basically do it the same way where you can just use the L, uh, the LD preload. To get um, to get the the, uh, the profile made. Uh, in this case, um, we're going to be testing uh, a Fizzbuzz application that it ha isn't even actually complete, um, and uh, it's basically the same type of thing. You get a number of interruptions and what have you, um, and then when you are. Uh, Oh, so it didn't. <laughs> uh, am I in the right? Oh, I am. Oh. 
That's because I didn't do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that basically, um, so the reason why I didn't get any interrupts for this is because this program runs fast enough that it actually doesn't catch anything. Um, so I ended up putting in a sleep that, um, that basically can be caught if you look for it specifically. Uh, no. I guess I will be showing that. Yes, I'm going to be showing that later. So um, basically, the, the LD Pro uh, preload can be used for uh, Unix, uh, specifically Linux. Um, I tried using it in Mac, and because of it, because it's using .dylib files, it doesn't seem to accept that. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do it, uh, how to do it for Rust in Mac, um, because it's a little bit different. You kind of need to uh, to do things uh, where you're actually in, you're actually using it as a uh, as part of the linker. So um, if we go into this and say, okay, that's what it is. Um, and we run it with the linker, uh, Rust uh, takes, is taking the test argument so that it's saying that it's going to be running the tests instead of just running the, the file. The dash C argument is basically to say when you are compiling the compiling the code, take these arguments and, and do something with them. In this case, I'm passing an argument to the linker that's being used, and that linker uh, is adding the library uh, profiler. Um, this is all using uh, the, in Mac's case, the Clang uh, compiler to, to take in all of the libraries. Um, so when we run this, it will generate the <laughs> All of the warnings of me not finishing this particular file, but it also generates um, the FizzBuzz executable. Now, with the FizzBuzz exec executable, um, we can get um, a an output. Uh, that we can then. Um, we can then find what that uh, what that real time uh, calculation is because we're doing the sleep, and so uh, the CPU profile is the same. Where we're we're taking in a uh, a file path that we're going to be writing to, and then the CPU profile real time is basically saying I want to be checking the uh, the wall time uh, based on my profiles rather than how much time the CPU is spending. Um, so it's uh, CPU time versus wall time. Um, and so in this case, we should get like a couple of, uh, I think five or 500 um, interrupts. And that's basically because by default, it's interrupting uh, 100 times a second and the, the sleep is there for five seconds. So when we go in now to get this, um, this is where I like pulled out my hair for the longest time because I didn't realize just how secure Rust actually is. Um, when you profile this, you don't actually get any symbols. Um, Rust is very good about um, trying to keep as much as possible to itself so that uh, you don't have any programs doing, some, doing something with your code that you don't expect. Um, and so I wrestled with this for, I want to say, about a week and a half or more. Uh, and wasn't able to get anywhere with that. Uh, so then I just decided to move on to another language uh, to see if I could get anything out uh, that way. But this kind of is a little bit of a testament to how Rust is made to keep your code as safe as possible. Um, so that's how to use it with a compiled language. Basically, you're linking it using uh, GCC or Clang or uh, G++, whatever. Um, compiler you would normally use, and you just link in the, uh, the profiler library. Um, any questions about that? <laughs> OK. So then, um, now we're going to go and look at how to, um, how to do it with Ruby. 
Um, Ruby, somebody was very kind and created the perf tools, uh, is it in this one? Oh God, it's so small. <laughs> Okay, so um, he created two, uh, two libraries, and I apologize about the size of this. They are um, stackprof for Ruby 2.1 and above, um, and perftools.rb for uh, all other versions of Ruby. And so in this particular case, because stackprof is actually doesn't use gperftools, we're going to use uh, perftools.rb. Uh, and it's relatively simple. Um, you can... Uh, basically just include it in your gem file um, and then basically you can just use require to require perf tools as the gem um, and then to actually profile something you just can use a block syntax specifying the uh, the file name that you're going to be writing to and inside the block is what you're actually profiling so in this case this is a Conway's Game of Life implementation that I um, snatched off of the internet uh, because I needed something that wasn't proprietary code from my company. Um, so uh, when running this, uh, all you need to do is actually just, um, this was me being confused about things for a bit. You basically just run it with the, with the bundle um, and it will give you the output of the program, which is the, the game of life simulation, and then the interrupts and evictions and bytes that we are used to. And then uh, you just run using the pprof.rb file. Basically, uh, this gem actually uh, installs its own version of pprof um, that has uh, a couple of patches put onto it to make it uh, as compatible with Ruby as possible. It's actually a really interesting gem when you when you look into it. But um, you just give it the text output again, and it gives you this as an output. It's like we saw with, uh, with the Python, except really nice uh, method names and everything. So um, to get an idea of how to read this, um, we're going to go back to, uh, to the source code. And here, we see that we're basically just doing the uh, game.new and then the play method on the game object. So if we go back here and we look at game play on this line here, as you can see, we don't have it doesn't show up in the as the, the top object of the call stack. However, it actually shows up as uh, all of its descendants as 85.9% of the entire runtime. Uh, that is actually um, inverse to the garbage collector, which is running 14.1% of the time. So if you add those together, that's 100% of the time, and that's the, the entirety of what's being run. So going back to... Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, so this is profiling the uh, Ruby interpreter in C, in the same way that you were interpreting the Python C Python. Yeah. But it knows, unlike with Python, it actually knows what Ruby code's being executed. Yeah, that, that is part of the gem. Like, he did quite a number of things to, to be able to, like, get the, like, 100% correct symbols and everything like that. Um, it's, like, if you're, doing the, if you're doing this in, say, like, a compiled language like C or whatnot, generally speaking, you're going to be uh, sending in all of your... Um, all the libraries that contain the, uh, the symbols that you're using in your code. And with that information, it should be able to compile a list that looks somewhat similar to this. Um, it's not going to be quite as garbled. Um, I don't know if anyone's working on a, like a Python egg for, uh, for this that like prettifies it, but um, this, uh, this is specifically somebody like Knowing quite a bit about uh, about both the, the perf tools library and uh, C programming and whatnot, and like messing around with things to kind of link it directly into Ruby. Um, 
but this is what like this is the output that I was used to that like made me really kind of fall in love with it. Um, and this is like when I first saw it, uh, it was in a Rails project, and you're gonna see like just how horrible uh, and complicated Rails can be. Um, but for right now, we're gonna continue diving into what's going on with this to to find where we're spending the most time. So if we look at the at the play method. Um, we see that we're taking uh, a number of steps and, and iterating over them and then calling the next method. So if we look at this again, the next method shows up here um, and shows up as 4.7% at the top of the stack and then 74.2% uh, of it is the, the rest of, the, uh, of its colleagues and what have you. So, What's interesting was we lost like 10-ish percent, like 15 percent. Um, and so if we look at this, we've got uh, system clear and puts self. And if we go back um, and we look at this, we can see that IO puts is taking roughly 2.3 percent of the time. And uh, what was the other one? Because I do not remember. <laughs> um, Oh, uh, system, system clear, uh, and that is taking up 9.4%. So that's the like 11-ish percent that we ended up losing uh, between game play and game next. So 11% over the total, like the overall, not really that big of a deal. You can kind of move on and just continue digging into the next code. Um, so. If we look at next, we see that we're iterating over a bunch of cells, uh, and then we're looking at each one of the rows, and then we're saying, okay, the check to see how many neighbors are at this particular location, and then pass in an a y and x uh, amount. So if we go back to this profile, we can see uh, alive neighbors is taking up 62.9% of the total time uh, of the descendants. So that's probably where you're going to focus because you're only missing about 12% from all the other steps in that. So when you dig into Alive Neighbors, let's see. And I will say that like this is the first time that I'm actually, uh, oh, it is apparently a UK spelling. Um, so Alive Neighbors goes through and says, uh, Look, at this, look for the sides, look for uh, above, the, the row above and the row below, um, and then basically iterates over that, that collection and says, um, effectively, are there any cells um, in any of these locations? And if so, we're going to add them to the running total. Um, so this is, we're looking at probably inject as being the, the biggest thing. Um, and if we look up here, that is where 55.4% uh, of the, the overall time with 46.5% being inside of the actual block. So that is where, if we were looking at this trying to make it faster, probably where we're only gonna spend all of our time. Um, that's pretty obvious in this case because it's very clear what's uh, what's going on, and so I figured I would show you what it looks like when you're doing it with a Rails um, project. And this is something that I profiled uh, at my job a while back. And we got 4,140 samples, so that was four seconds or so. 51.2% was spent in the garbage collector. So objects everywhere. Um, but if you look at this, it goes on for a really, really, really long time. There are 569 methods that were found in this call stack. Like, what's, what's kind of interesting with, uh, with uh, PPROP, you can get all sorts of different outputs, like a, a call graph using uh, dot, you can use um, call grind, uh, call grind uh, to to find out more. Um, 
but if you look at like the visual graph that represents it, it is enormous and everything is connected to everything else and it just makes me want to cry, which is kind of why when I first started using this, I was like, oh, I can get a shiny call graph and it's going to be great. And then I got the output and I was like, I have no idea where any of my code actually is. And so what you ended up, like what I ended up finding is that that call graph was completely useless and I ended up using like that type of methodology like where did we come in? Oh, we came in at the deal serializer um, getting two JSON. Uh, so if I were to do deal serializer pound, no, no, okay, so no, it's actually the, uh, the active model serializer method. And that gives us the 48.8% the that was inverse to the garbage collector again because lol rails. Um, but yeah, so like basically when using the text output, you kind of find where you're entering your code from and then you can just follow your code as you're looking through it to, to, to find where all of, um, where you're spending all of that time. Like if I, if I were to dig into this, um, if I remember correctly, it ended up being uh, a, the, the, coupons calculator in this case that basically was spending like a vast majority of the time. If you look at this, it's 33.9%, which is like 10% less than the overall total of everything that was being done in it. Um, but when you're using it with, a, when you're using uh, PProf and uh, perf tools with a library, you're gonna have to look through a lot of extraneous code and focus only on what you actually wrote. Cause like, if we go back up to the top, um, we can see that like most of these things are like MySQL result each. I didn't write that. The library wrote it. Or array map. Well, yeah, there's a lot of arrays that we're looking over. So like the, the standard way of looking at it and just saying like uh, the, the left three columns didn't really work for me. And so um, if you're using a library, you're gonna find that you're gonna need to like dig into your code specifically. For MySQL, is being sampled while it's waiting for MySQL? Yes, it, it, is an inter, it is an interruption in the classic sense. It says, hold on, let me look at everything. Okay, you can go again. So um, running this on production, probably not the best idea because <laughs> it will actually slow things down a bit. Um, stack prop, which is like the, the improvement on this, uh, goes through and um, actually uh, improves that a little bit by having a built-in, like every X number of things you can, you can sample it, um, which allows you to keep it in production when you just push something new out and you wanna see like overall how it affects things, but you don't wanna impact too many users. So you could say like, Every 200 requests get me a profile, or every 500 requests gets me get me a profile. So you're not affecting that many users, but you still get like production information that's uh, useful in going stepping through your code. Um, so, any questions about any of that? Um, no, so, um, so like I said with the, the Rust code, that was probably obscured a bit. Um, you can have it do a wall time, but this is actually the CPU time. So it, only, it is only going to interrupt when the process or something the process called is running. Um, so basically when it's active. So if you have like, a crap ton of other things going on and you're running this, it might take 50 seconds, but if the CPU only spent like 20 seconds on this, you're still only gonna get like 2,000 uh, samples. Got it. So, any other questions? And like, do you want me to go over anything in more depth about like how to get the compiled output? Or um, maybe show what 
show a little bit. Oh, the one last thing that I wanted to show, I don't know if I mentioned it, was that um, Go has this built into the language itself. Um, and if you search as I did, um, just like Go uh, perf tools, you basically get um, a direct link to the uh, the fact that it is a package directly built into the to the, the standard libraries, um, and it works uh, fairly similarly. Where you're basically like in this case, it's doing it for any HTTP server that you've created. It will sample a uh, a request that you hit. So in this case, it's basically saying, okay. Um, I want to start up Go, and I want to use pprof to profile uh, what happens when I hit this endpoint. Uh, or actually, no, not that endpoint. When I hit any endpoint and it has something running, and this, is, this allows you to look at the heap profiles that are available, or the CPU profiles, um, or the blocking profiles. But it's built into the language, so um, that's kind of neat that Google was like, we're going to use our own tool to make this language a little bit better. Um, and if we look at, yep. if we look at a rough output, um, a lot of times when, uh, when using it with C++ or C code or whatnot, you're going to get an output that looks something like this, where you get like a library name and the uh, the, uh, I guess that, is that the header? I don't know exactly what that is. I don't do a lot of like um, systems level programming and the method or function name that's being called. So it gives pretty decent symbols as long as you're including them in, uh, in the, the tool. Um, the, the documentation about all the different uh, outputs is pretty good. Like, like I said, you can get a call grind output. Um, you can get the text output that we were looking at before. Um, there should be somewhere. Um, it's not specified there. But if I were to just go and say, oh, yeah, um, the GV is the, uh, the call graph, um, which the call graphs are really kind of scary. But <laughs> only for Rails code, in my opinion. Um, normally, when it's not Rails code, it's actually pretty succinct, like we saw with the, the text output. Uh, did you have a question? Or? OK. Um, but that was pretty much how to dive into the, the text output and get a, a good idea of where you should be focusing your time when, you are, uh, when you're looking to improve your code rather than just saying, oh, it's totally in this part, which has never worked out for me. Uh, I have an anecdote of uh, looking at one of the, uh, the massive rail stacks, trying to figure things out. Actually, was it? You know what? I think it was this one in particular, um, where um, in the, the code, we were spending like five seconds, as you can, uh, four to five seconds on this. And I would have looked everywhere except for where I ended up focusing. Uh, what ended up happening uh, is I found out that I should, that I uh, could memoize a single, very simple call to find out a timestamp, and that cut two seconds off of the load time. Like I would never have found that without using this tool, and that's why like getting actual data about where you should be focusing your time is super critical to actually spending that time wisely. And this tool, I have found massive improvements in a lot of the sites that I've worked on. Uh, one of the first jobs that I was doing Ruby in, I was able to drop uh, load times for a page, which was taking like 20 plus seconds to load, which never, ever acceptable, um, and dropped it to like sub three seconds by using this and just sticking at it. And I think it took like three days to get that improvement, if that. So like it drastically sped up how much time I was spending to, to get this. So it, even if it seems really daunting right now to, to use it, 
um, it's definitely, definitely worthwhile to take the time to, to learn the tool, to use it for your language, and then to, to get comfortable kind of diving into your code to, to find out where you should be focusing. So if we have any other questions, that's basically it. Yeah. On a large code program, mm -hmm. and it was horribly. I mean, the output is very similar to this, but the, that was a multi-threaded program. Yeah. It made things very hard. Multi-threading. Um, there is a way to get around that, and basically, you need to call a particular function almost immediately after starting the thread. In this case, I believe it's the exec function. Um, so it basically needs to reach into the, the lib profile um, library and call that function to say, hey, I'm also over here. Uh, if you don't do that, then <coughs> it won't know that that thread's also part of it. And it gets very confused very quickly and probably ends up seg bolting. I don't know. But that is specifically called out in the documentation. Um, if I were to look in particular, Um, so, yeah, um, there's like this giant, uh, there's, there's a bunch of things that say like, here are some 64-bit issues, here are some, um, like, issues with older systems, and uh, there is something that does go into uh, how threads complicate things, but uh, it's... Uh, so, like it says here, CPU profiling doesn't work after a fork unless you immediately do an exec-like call afterwards. So, um, that that's the stipulation. I don't know of any tool that will allow you to keep track of the various threads like very easily. So un that is an unfortunate part of our jobs. <laughs> Any other questions or? All right, that would be it. Thank you. Thank you.